Welcome, everyone, to the third Petaluma History episode of On Stage with Jim and Tom. Our first was a, uh, it's like a seminar episode with some of Tom's favorite stories, but also focused heavily on the 1950s through present day Petaluma. Absolutely, with some great storytellers, and gee, it was a good, a good fun time. And our second episode focused on Petaluma's Rivertown era, which was 1850 to about 1900, and the power players that really formed this town. Now, both of these episodes were recorded way back in 2014, and tonight we will have our returning champion who was featured on both of those episodes, and that is historian and 2019 Good Egg, John Sheehy. John, hello. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jim. John recently released a book on Petaluma history called On a River Winding Home, Stories and Visions of the Petaluma River Watershed. And tonight, you know, our goal is to zoom in on a variety of characters and stories that are featured in that book because it's a beautiful, rich, and extremely detailed one that has just, I mean, countless, countless, countless things. I mean, we could do seriously 100 episodes on this book. So tonight, just a a small sampling of things you'll find in there. So, hey, Tom, John, my God, welcome back. Welcome. Thank you. So the goal of this episode is to really bring some of these stories to life. And I want to start with Tom, um, you feel so passionately about this city's history. And I, I want to revisit a discussion we had last week about the, uh, the bathtub installation. Oh. I don't want to go into the bathtubs, no. but I want to, <laughs> I want you to zoom in. God forbid we'd be here for an hour on yeah, that, yeah, we... but I want you to go into, uh, why that area is so sacred to you and why the town is so sacred to you. Well, I, so I think growing up in Petaluma is, it was, was one of the best places you could grow up. And uh, even when I was a kid, uh, roaming the streets of, of old school, old downtown Petaluma was also one of my favorite things to do ever. And uh, at a very young age, I was unleashed in this town and able to ride freely about downtown Petaluma on my bicycle from probably the age of six or seven. Um, and hanging out on the river. And when my brother and I were young, we lived in the Linda Del Mar tract, which was uh, a part of the original Cedar Grove uh, uh, ranch or whatever that was called the Cedar Grove piece of property. And it was at the backwaters of one of the fingers of the Petaluma Estuary, the Petaluma River. And we used to build rafts and try and float them. And they never floated. We ended up swimming, I think, every time, catching frogs and, and uh, hanging out in the river as a young kid, uh, riding downtown, learning how stoplights work and all of those things, <laughs> watching uh, a, a lot of my heroes uh, growing up, a lot of the old school Petaluma guys that were still in downtown Petaluma when I was a kid. And it just was an exciting place to grow up. And when I hit my teens, uh, I'd be walking these streets and I'd already heard so many stories from a good friend of mine, Bill Sobranis, about what life was like in the uh, uh, way before I'd gotten here. And I could imagine myself following in the footsteps of some of these uh, great stories that I'd heard and actually walking over these same streets that some of these wonderful people had walked. And it just, I've always felt a part of that community. And I know, I think with John, because John and I have been swapping stories forever, I think John has a similar tale to tell about that. Yeah, I, well, mine's a little different story. I mean, I, I grew up here with Tom, and my family's been here since 1863. So I grew up hearing a lot of those stories around the dinner table, and Bill Sobranos was a good friend of my parents, so he would often pop in while my sister and I were washing dishes after dinner, and my parents would go watch TV and Bill would just entertain us with stories in the kitchen because other people couldn't stand to listen to any more of it. (laughs) But um, by the time I got out of high school, um, I was ready to leave. I felt the weight of history kind of weighing down on me. And as Tom well knows, I bought a one-way ticket to Europe, and he drove me to the airport. First time I'd ever been on an airplane, and I swore I'd never come back. Um, But 25 years later, I did come back, and I was just blown away at the beauty of the place and the also the the powerful sense of place that was here i lived all around the world i lived all around the united states and i hadn't found anything like what i'd left in petaluma and so you know part of writing this book for me was really to dive in and deeply explore what gives this place such a powerful sense of place um and that was one thing um and the other thing was was um 
trying to confront a lot of the stories I'd grown up with um, and trying to get a little deeper beneath them. And in a sense, writing the book was an opportunity for me to do what I call restoring the landscape. So some people go out to restore a landscape. I am restoring it. And by that, I mean really expanding my understanding and hopefully others' understanding. Yeah, there's of a lot place of that. Called home. This so book. That, that, those are the two things that really put me off, put me into writing the book. And your book goes a long way towards uh, towards that very goal. Uh, it gives you such a great overlay. Uh, it starts uh, way early in the history of the valley. This is a story about the watershed of the Petaluma Estuary, uh, Petaluma Slough, whatever you want to call it. The Petaluma River. It wasn't named the Petaluma River until the fifties. I think it was. Uh, I think that was a political move so that we could actually gain some funds that we could dredge the river. Is that does that sound correct? That's exactly right. In eighteen fifty nine, it was it was sort of referred to in the past as the Petaluma River. When I was growing up, it was, and you too, it was often called the Petaluma Creek. Still, yeah. my family still called it the Creek. Yeah. Um, but formally, it, it was never really a river. Um, it's always an estuary that rises on the tide and falls on the tide twice a day. So uh, by giving it that designation, they were able to qualify for funding from the Army Corps of Engineers that dredged the river. Yeah, we found out about that, uh, the way the river flowed. I don't know, you, uh, I know John is keeping up with my brother up in Oregon, and you can check this story with him. As I recall, my dad uh, gave my brother and I a rowboat, and it was a wooden rowboat, and it was heavy. And we would put it out on the river, and we would row out with the tide. <laughs> and uh, try and row back in. And many times, it seemed like every time, we ended up trying to row back upstream, this heavy wooden rowboat against the tide going out. And it was almost impossible and probably kind of dangerous at that time. Uh, That was some of my first memories of this river. And your book is about the river and its watershed. And that watershed, I think, runs around the uh, pretty much the rim of the valley that this river is in. Is that correct? Yeah, that's pretty much. I mean, a watershed is that just one big river. The river, in this case, the Petaluma Estuary, is the main stem, and then all the tributary creeks and water sources flow into that stem. Yeah. So, you know, the Petaluma River is um, it's a saltwater estuary, but depending on the season, like in the winters, maybe up to 40-50% of it is fresh water running down from the mountains and whatnot. So, the watershed is defined by what creeks are running and feeding into the Petaluma River, essentially. I love this quote in the preface, and uh, it, I think it sums it up really well. You say, The intention of this book is not to promote a nostalgic yearning for the past, nor to lament that which has gone by the wayside. Its purpose is to bring alive the Petaluma River watershed in all of its complexity, past and present, for the sake of place-loving people, specifically those already rooted, becoming rooted, or even re-rooted in this area. So here we are. Welcome to Petaluma. Welcome to Petaluma. Um, this is a, a topic that we could, you know, obviously spend uh, 10 hours talking about, and let's not do that. But um, the people that inhabited this area long before it was called Petaluma, I was really struck, Tom, by something you said to me last week in the lead up to this episode uh, that you said in your uh, learning about our, our past here, that when you realize what it took to make this place available to us, it was uh, sobering and it brought you uh, sort of a sense of shame. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, certainly ill ease. Um, I think when you think about it, uh, first off, uh, the book is accentuated by the most incredible uh, photography work of Scott Hess, and uh, and he's and he's just done such a beautiful job of showing us how beautiful this valley can be now. But when you read uh, the introduction, John's introduction uh, in the book, and you read about the early history in the book, stuff that I'd known about when I was a kid, but had relearned when I read your book uh, about the people that used to live here and how beautiful this valley was and the rivers and streams that were flowing so freely in those days, the the vast uh, plains of of, uh, grasses and the the huge herds of elk and and, uh, all of the animals, the deer and and, uh, the wild animals that were peopling the the valley that that we live in and how beautiful this must have looked. Uh, 200 years ago, even 150 years ago, uh, right down to the fact that there's a lake that nobody, there was a lake that nobody really knew about uh, in, in our time, uh, the Tole Lake. And uh, this lake was out Lakeville Highway. It's how, if you go out, leave Petaluma and go south on Lakeville, 
Uh, you go to a point where you can start looking to the right as you're heading out of town, and you'll see where there used to be a lake there. And it was, it was blocked by a natural dam, and uh, this lake was thought to be a magic place uh, by, by the, uh, the Miwoks and the Pomos that had lived in this area. John, does that check out? Yes, it does. And as a matter of fact, when my family uh, immigrated to this area from Ireland in 1863, they settled on the north end of Tole Lake. And um, they, that was the family wheat farm and then dairy farm up until the 1920s, 30s. And I'd grown up hearing all these stories of Tolay Lake. My grandmother was born there. My great uncles were all grown there. I never knew it was an actual lake, an actual lake when we went out to see it until um, more recently, you know, that I discovered that. And that that's something that just wasn't common knowledge, as Tom is saying, when we were growing up at the time. We'd heard Tolay Lake. I'd heard it a bunch, but never imagined oh, yeah. that it was a real lake. I, I don't know what right. I thought it was. I, I also didn't realize my family settled there in 1863, and... And for what the archaeologists can fathom at this point, it was drained in 1870. So about, they had a 120-acre ranch there, and I would say about 40 acres of it extended across the north end of Tolay Lake. So they would have benefited from the draining of the lake. That would have expanded, you know, the, the, the area that they had to plant wheat at the time dramatically. And I never heard those stories sitting around the, the dinner table at night either. Now what about the, uh, some of the magic that surrounded that lake? Oh, yeah, that was the Aligali who were down by San Pablo Bay. That was their village down there. And um, Greg Saris, who is the chairman of Great Rancheria, describes Tole Lake at the time as sort of the Stanford Medical Center of the whole West yes. Coast. Yeah. So uh, it would attract medicine men and medicine women from up and down the coast who would travel here. And my sense is they would, you know, they would convene like at a convention in a sense. But they also came there uh, with charm stones, and the charm stones were two to three inches. Some of them were carved in certain ways, and they were used to extract illness from members of the tribes. And they would bring the stones to the lake and then throw them in the lake to drown the illness. Um, so it was a very powerful place. And there's, if you now that it's a uh, regional park, if you go there from the lake side, you can hike up to a little ridge on the west side, and from there, there's a special spot that was kind of a power spot at the time. You can see down Saddam Pablo Bay, you can see up Petaluma River, right. and then you can see all the mountain ridges. You can see Mount Diablo in the south, you can see Mount Tamapias, Mount Burdell across the way, you can see Sonoma Mountain, you can even see Mount St. Helena. And there was something about the convergence of all those mountains on that one spot that gave it some special spiritual powers that drew people to that area as well. So it's very, it's a very special place yeah, absolutely. Um, in the heritage of the, of the Coast Miwok and the native uh, Indians along the area here. You had said something, Tom, too, about um, no one would fight at this time. Because there was a there was a uh, belief system around this, you know. There, uh, that's true. That's one of my favorite stories, and I actually learned that from John. If if, if I get this wrong, let me know. But it seemed as though, uh, first off, quite a bit of of uh, the governing of of the families and the tribes and the nations that lived in this area, it was almost a matriarchy. Uh, there was a male that was appointed by a group of of older women to be the figurehead of the group and would speak a lot of times and it, uh, it, when it came time for him to speak. I think that was his daily chore, as a matter of fact, to address his, his neighbors and, and friends and, and tell them what's going on. And then there was a group of women uh, who were actually kind of directing him in the way that went. And uh, at this time, uh, having your own personal magic was more important than being stronger than your friends or enemies. Uh, if you found yourself in a dispute with someone and it, it came to physical altercation, uh, you'd lost your power. You apparently did not have enough magic in you to come to a better solution. And therefore, it left you open to be attacked by anybody that wanted to because you didn't have the magic power to protect you. Uh, does that sound kind of correct? Yeah, basically. I, I think that they saw the world as very spiritual in all its aspects, and each being was very spiritual as well. So I don't know if magic powers or spiritual powers were what people uh, held to them, their own beings, 
But the idea is that those spiritual powers formed a deterrent to violence. And if you resorted to hitting somebody or, or striking somebody or, or, or injuring them, it showed that you really didn't have the spiritual power and that therefore they would take you out because they weren't afraid of spiritual retribution coming from you. Um, wow. And people are often poisoned is the way they killed people in those times who uh, resorted to violence like that. So that was an interesting deterrent in the communities in that sense. Yeah, it's beautiful, actually, in its own right. But I guess that at the same time points out that they that they had a uh, uh, a form of execution going on. Kind yeah, of. they did. They and I think, punishment. you know, my sense with the, the women in, in our modern world, I sort of see them as a board of directors. And sort of the male chief that they select is sort of like the executive director yeah. or the president, in a sense. Sure. And he, he operates at the at their uh, will, essentially. And when they didn't like the job he was doing, they would replace him, and they'd bring somebody else up from the tribe. So it wasn't like a lifelong appointment as the chief in that sense. Um, and um, you know, you had to perform essentially. So it's an interesting mix. The other thing that's interesting to me that. I learned in the research, in terms of the food sources, you know, the acorns became vitally important to all the natives in this area because it meant they didn't have to be nomads traveling from one place to another as the seasons change and the, you know, the, the salmon were running at the Russian River or yeah. the ducks were migrating down Petaluma Marsh area and whatnot and people were fighting over food resources. Acorns uh, essentially gave them reserves that they kept in storage yeah. for those months, especially in the winter and whatnot, where uh, other food sources weren't as plentiful. And that allowed them to, to stay in one place. And one thing I found out is that like people who grew up here in the villages or the little tribelets, um, in their lifetime, most of them never traveled more than eight miles from where they were born. And in terms of food sources, they cultivated these groves of um, oak trees for the acorns. Yeah. Uh, some of the early Spanish who came here described them as roblers, which is a term for uh, sort of manu that manicured groves of trees. Um, and each family had their own individual trees, but then the village itself had communi communal access to trees that were up in the hills. So there's an interesting mix of sort of individual ownership of the food source and then this kind of communal source. Like if your trees weren't performing or if they had diseased or whatnot, you had access to going out to the communal trees and gathering your acorns, which is another very interesting kind of social way of, of operating a, a group of people. You know, actually, uh, a social and, and, uh, and an incredible way of managing your forests. Um, they actually had uh, they actually had some technology about backfires and, and uh, uh, small right. fires uh, uh, under the trees and, and uh, in some of the higher grass areas to keep the the, uh, the fires down in the fire season. As I well, also to keep the disease down from the acorns, they would burn under and they would they would trim the trees. They they did grooming. Um, it, it very sophisticated ways of working in balance with nature around them. Essentially, um, yeah. The names of the tribes are pretty much assigned by Europeans when they come here. But within the Coast Miwok in this area, there were three major villages and uh, tribes named after those villages, and they were Lickituit, which is, as Tom was saying, was located essentially in Petaluma at yeah. what's now called Cedar Grove or was, and that's over at Peyran, where Peyran meets Petaluma Boulevard North, uh, right behind the clover plant right now. And it's still a, a very closed off little area where the Lickituit village was. Yeah. And then uh, Olampali was another major village uh, down where Olampali Park is right now. It's on the way, and, if you follow a Highway the, uh, 101 South, uh, you can see it on the right uh, just before you come into Novato, kind of. Right. And those two, and then there was a third village called Petaluma. Now, I, 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 it's a little hard to get a handle on Petaluma itself. It was about three miles north west of downtown in a sense but uh it's i had a little trouble getting much information whereas look to it was pretty well established in olam Pali because they were both on the trade route and that was very important so olam Pali was like if you, at that time in town where you know around western avenue to washington street along the boulevard it was all marshy there so look to it out at cedar grove was the first place you got to high ground 
and that became a major trading post for the natives. And Olimpali, which was on the route from uh, San Rafael out to the coast, was another major trading hub, too, that people came to and, and passed through. And then each of these villages during the seasons, when uh, whether they were gathering acorns or uh, they were hunting or they were fishing or, or whatnot, there would be little villages set up along, like, the rivers. Like the San Antonio Creek would have a bunch of tribelets, as it was called. Um, and then they would all come back to the main village in the off-season, in a sense, where they'd have celebrations and whatnot. Um, so those are the three main um, villages in this area here, all under the Coast Miwok Indian tribe. You have anything to add, Tom? No, I just, you know, I, I, I think back to those days and wonder how beautiful, uh, what an incredible life they must have had uh, living here, uh, raising families, and, and uh, just the food sources were quite plentiful. Uh, the water was, was good, and uh, just what a great place this would have been to be in those days. And these stories you hear about when the ducks took off down in the marshes during the migration season, it would, like, blacken the sky. You yeah. know, things, stories like that are just... And yeah. some of the early settlers who came here in 1850, I know I live, I live on Stone Mountain near Copeland Creek. The guy who settled at the bottom of the creek, he said the fish were so plentiful when they were running you could reach in and just pull them out of the creek by hand. By hand. Well, they were using bolos uh, yes. to, to, to hunt the ducks. You'd throw these bolos, I guess, and boy, you'd, you'd probably just, one would wrap around the neck and bring it down. That's how plentiful the ducks must have been. You could probably just throw into a group of them and bring something down. It would have been incredible. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. They had a really good, you know, from what I've read, I mean, until the acorns became established, there, there were fights and there were wars over food sources, and then after the acorn became established as a staple, there was more peace among these tribes in this area, and there was a lot of, and that was accentuated by trade between the tribes, essentially, uh, all the way up to Lake County, where they got the obsidian, and yeah. they traded other things, out to the coast, where they got the clamshell, they made, they had their own money source, which were clamshell beads, they were kept on a string. And they essentially were like dollar bills. You know, you, you use that for trade and purchasing things. They had value, um, which is another fascinating way of how they operated. Yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit about the Petaluma Adobe. It was, Tom was kind of shocked to hear me say this earlier, that I, I think the vast majority of people who live in Petaluma, who've, you know, uh, settled here in the last, say, 10 years, 20 years, I think there's not a lot of knowledge that that's even there, let alone like why it's there and what it was. Yeah, you know, it used to be a Saturday activity for my my friends and I. We'd get on our bikes and ride out there, and it was so much fun. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, before we go there, Jim, I wonder if I can just uh, go back to one last thing about the native coast Miwok here because it was a it was a big inspiration for me in the book. Please. And um, one thing I learned about them is that. Storytelling was a long-standing tradition that they used legends and oral traditions to define their surroundings. And by that, I mean that every landmark, and remember, we're living in a watershed now, and they define their world by the watershed, essentially. Those are natural boundaries. They didn't, they didn't look at roads or uh, county lines or city limits or anything like that. Uh, but within the watershed, the way they navigated were all these landmarks. And you might think about Two Rock. Uh, out west was one of the prominent landmarks if you were on the trade route going out to Bodega. But every landmark had its own story. And that story was passed down from generation to generation. Um, And I think that was a symbol in a sense of it it, it united the tribe. It gave them a sense of heritage. It gave them a sense of of tribal kind of uh, belonging in a sense. And it deepened their roots to the place they lived. And when I read that early on in my research, that's what I wanted the book to do, in a sense, you know, because I think that uh, the story deepened our roots where we live. And we talked earlier about uh, nostalgia. We're all, especially those of us, the three of us who grew up here, you know, we're all trapped to some degree by our own memories, our own nostalgia of what this place was like. But when you hear stories that go generations back that are passed on to you, that sort of um, gives you a sense of continuum of the past, and it releases you from that, what I call the, the self-prison of nostalgia, in a sense. And you get a sense of continuity, that there are people before you, and also 
after you're gone, there are going to be people uh, that carry on after you. And so that gives you a perspective that you're actually a steward here. And what the time you have here, you have to take care of this place. And I think and that's what the stories were used as um, for the natives with their landmark storytelling, essentially. And that was a great inspiration to me for this book, too. Tom, you have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, again, if, if you grew up in Petaluma, uh, like I did, and love it as much as I always have, and as much as John does, and I think as much as you do, Jim. Yeah, you. Uh, I, I. I want it to. <laughs> I want people to remember the, the the stuff that came before me and the stuff that comes before them, uh, and it's uh, it's uh, it's the history of mankind. Uh, I, the Indians go back in this area, um, a couple thousand years, I think. John, how? Oh, how, more than that. <laughs> they do. Are they? Are they? Are they, are they on the line of yeah, ten thousand? Yeah, you know, 000? I think. Talking with Breck Parkman, uh, who's retired as a state park archaeologist at Olin Poly and over at the Selma Mission, um, who does a great job if you ever take a walk with Breck Parkman and Olin Poly. Oh, my God. But, you know, there are signs that the natives have been here at least 12,000 years. 12, he said other archaeologist reports are coming out as much as 17,000 years. Oh. Um, pretty astounding. Yeah. Well, you you know, it's... it's uh you can understand how it doesn't snow here. It doesn't freeze often. Uh, this would be an incredible place to live uh, if you want to live off the land. Again, in uh, when when the first uh, uh, natives uh, arrived, they probably were just astounded by the amount of food and water and, and resources that they had available to them. This would have been a wonderful place to be, you know, some of the first hippies, as it were. <laughs> it makes perfect <laughs> sense that it all came to a head in San Francisco. And I might add that the Grateful Dead, uh, members of the Grateful Dead, were able to rent the Olam uh, uh yeah. grounds for a while and live out there for a year or two. Yeah, and then they were succeeded by a commune called the Chosen Family that actually were a bunch of hippies who lived there after the Grateful Dead left. So yeah. kind of came full, until they accidentally broke the place down, but it kind of yes. came full circle. It did. If you're uh, comfortable jumping ahead to Petaluma Adobe, I know it it does uh, a oh, great yeah. it does a great dishonor to all the million things that happened between what we were just discussing and the founding of the Adobe. But we haven't on this show yet gone into the Petaluma Adobe, and uh, it's a, a place with a hugely broad history. So maybe if uh, you, you guys wouldn't mind kind of painting some broad strokes about why it was established and you know its significance. I I just love a quote in this book, John where you talk about the um, <laughs> the general who was asked to establish this and that uh, the person who gave him that task, quote, apparently didn't realize he was asking a fox to guard the oh, yeah. house. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think what Tom was just talking about, about the adobe for those of us who grew up when Tom and I did, I mean, that was, to me, it was like uh, the land of Oz, you know, and... And the first time I tried to ride my bicycle out there, me and my buddy, we had stingrays, and we were like in fifth, sixth grade uh, out at Wilson School on Bodega Avenue. And we, we took off after school one afternoon because we'd read about General Vallejo, and he was like our hero. This sounded like going to the land of Oz. And we only made it to Casa Grande Road before darkness. Oh, kind you of were right there. Us. <laughs> but, you know, Casa Grande Road was his his main road, his... From the adobe, the ox carts came down Cascarenda Road to where the Rocky Dog Park is today, and that was his landing where he shipped all his hides and and other goods down to San Francisco, essentially. So it's very appropriate to be going up the yellow brick road of Cascarenda Road, but we never made it that night, and the the sheriff picked us up and took us home because our parents put out a a missing persons (laughs) report at the time. But... um, could I you just know, ask? I could I just ask why he was your hero at that young age? Oh, he well, great. because he was painted in such rosy terms. Yes. He was like the founder of the area. He'd established yeah. Petaluma. He'd built this incredible fort. He'd had all these people working there, and he had he had a, this, his own militia out there essentially. And they were we'd have old Adobe days, and yes. and uh, Bill Sobranis would have his Whiskerino contest going yes. out there, and yep, that's you know true. they were like fan, they were like a it was like a. Um, celebration to the fandangos that that oh, they gosh. had at that time in they the culture. They had everybody in costume and and uh, yes. they would show tallow being melted but at the same time I think fourth grade was the field trip that most Petaluma kids took to the mission in uh, Sonoma uh, 
And we, le- uh, we learned about uh, General Vallejo there. And I want to point out, as I recall, General Vallejo actually was the one that made himself a general. Uh, I, I think yeah. he promoted himself now that I think about it. He, he came maybe as a colonel, maybe even a lesser soldier. But, uh, yeah, he, he was a lieutenant, actually. He was a lieutenant, yeah. And, but, uh, but he was given the, the, the title of Commandant General, which was not a formal military <laughs> title. Commandant General of the Northern California Territory, essentially. But it wasn't a military title as General. But he did, they did call him General, and he did take that name, as you're saying. At a young age, 27 years old, he was he was studying, like, Roman history, it seems yeah. like. And he was he was, like, learning how to, like, establish an empire. I mean, it, it, just incredible stuff. The, the sort of thing that nowadays you just don't see. It's just really in, incredible that he just, like, I guess saw an opening, saw a vacuum, and filled it. Well, he was a Machiavellian character, I think. And I, I describe him as the best of a bad lot at the time. And when he grew up, grew up he was trained by the Franciscans. And they ran the missionary system and the school system. But he secretly read the Romans on his own. And he came really infatuated with them. And he saw the Spanish, um, the Spanish coming into California very much like the Roman Empire, coming into a wilderness with a bunch of savages and imposing order in the way the Romans did in their time. Um, And he also learned from them the technique of divide and conquer. And that's what he used as a technique throughout his entire career. Uh, but he's very Machiavellian, uh, he's very opportunistic, and when he saw an opportunity, he went for it. Um, he didn't like the Padres, he didn't like the Franciscan order at all, like a lot of the military at that time. He saw them with these uh, big missions, they had all these natives working for them, they had big herds of cattle, they were raising uh, grains and whatnot, and uh, a lot of the military felt that they were entitled to that. So what happened is in uh, 1834, when the missions were secularized, essentially uh, the military stepped in and took over a lot of them. And that's, that's where Vallejo stepped into the Soma mission and took over all the land and all the cows and the sheep that they were raising at that time. Um, and then he just established himself from that point forward in his own little fiefdom here at the time. And when did he fall out of power? When did he fall out of his position of authority? Well, it was he taken didn't until him. the Americans came. But yeah. so he came here in 1834 to Stoma Mission, um, and um, he established Petaluma in 1836. They started building the mission, essentially. And you know, he what he told the governor at the time, the, the Mexican governor, is. The Russians had established Fort Ross, and the Russians had come here at about 1812 or so, and they were they were hunting sea otter for furs. And Fort Ross was uh, one of their main ports in California. So there was always a fear that the Russians would come further south and then pinch upon the Spanish, essentially. So they sent, in 1834, uh, Vallejo was a rather young lieutenant, and they sent him up there to meet with the Russians and find out what their intentions were. Well, he went to Fort Ross and they greeted him like a long lost neighbor and they treated him well and they fed him well and they got along really well. And they wanted, they wanted uh, grain, they wanted wheat and whatnot for their uh, settlements up in Alaska. That's one of the things they were negotiating and they wanted to get that from the Spanish. So Vallejo left Fort Ross and he went back to the governor and he said, oh my God, they're looking to move south we've got to get a fort up in Petaluma area, like right away, <laughs> which was all yeah, manufactured from yes, what yeah. the records show. And now a lot of the Russian documents have been translated and we see how the Russians at the fort at the time uh, saw Vallejo. They did not see the, the, Russian, uh, the Spanish as a threat. They were about ready to leave Fort Ross because they had pretty much uh, exhausted all the sea otters along the coast. So there's no need for them to stay any longer. But Vallejo used this to his advantage to get the governor to, A, establish him at the Snowa mission, and B, to allow him to build a fort in Petaluma to defend uh, essentially the southern part of California. The fort that he built uh, using native labor, and these were all natives who had been living at the Snowa mission, um, essentially wasn't really a fort, it was a factory. 
Uh, it was never manned with military. Uh, Blay had his own kind of unit of military guys. And one thing to understand is that the Mexican government in California at the time was very fluid. There was a lot of intrigue going on, and governors lasted from one to two years, and they were uh, there were a lot of power plays. So what Blayo did is establish his own power base here in Sonoma County with his own military, and then what the fort at Pebble Modobi allowed him to do is create a factory. And with all these uh, native uh, uh, California Indians working in his factory, essentially, for him. Yeah. And that's where he built his money, essentially. And he, he raised cattle. He took the mission cattle and he expanded it. He sent one of his guys over to England and brought a bunch of sheep back. Um, and then he started raising uh, wheat, essentially. And so um, those were the things that made him money. Um, and he exported those down to San Francisco the cattle, it's kind of sad. They, they weren't interested in the meat. They, these longhorn cattle that the missionaries had brought with them, they wanted the hides because they wanted to make leather out of the hides, and they wanted the tallow for making candles and soap. Yeah, and soap. So when the ox carts went down Casa Grande Road from the Pedal Adobe to what is now Bucky Ugg Park, uh, they load onto boats going down to San Francisco, they would load all these hides and all this tallow. The meat was often just left by the streams where they slaughtered the cattle for the grizzly bears and wolves and coyotes and whatnot to eat on. They jerkied some of the meat, but they weren't really interested in the meat that much. Um, and that's how he made his money. That was, and the wool from the sheep uh, was woven, and that was also shipped away. And a lot of the tallow and leather goods were shipped to Europe, it turns out, and later to New England in the 1840s, where they wanted leather goods. So that was that was the focus of the Petaluma Adobe all those years, yeah. as a factory. Just a fascinating character, you know? I mean, oh, yeah. Just a, a person who would not take no for an answer, and was... Uh, very good at just getting his way. And so, Tom, you were kind of referencing that, uh, you know, he he had to see his way out of that position uh, when the when the uh, the Yankees came over. But he acqui- acquiesced pretty quickly. And uh, I think he actually uh, found himself uh, as one of the uh, uh, California's first uh, elected lawmakers. Uh, I think he was in the first California assembly, as I recall. Um, and. Uh, uh, and I think he remained in politics for boy for quite a while in this state. Speaking of his uh, problematic past, he helped lawmakers draft the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians that legalized slavery of the natives. Yeah, that was one of his first acts when he was elected like, yeah. to the first legislature yeah. when they created the Constitution of California. Yeah, which is a, it, kind of strange in a lot of ways because in later years he portrayed himself as a big friend of the Indians, yeah. but. That allowed, um, if you saw an Indian not employed on the road, you were, uh, as a, a white person, you were allowed to capture that Indian and put him to work. Um, likewise, um, orphans were uh, immediately farmed out to farms of white people as well uh, after that. Um, so it was a very sad law that went into effect uh, with the Indians. It basically enslaved the Indians after uh, California was established as a state yeah. by the Americans. June 14th, 1846, a band of Yankees called the Bear Flaggers invaded his home in Sonoma and took him prisoner. War between Mexico and America declared a month later. And then Vallejo, had he was in prison, and then after two months he, he returned home. His, his uh, Rancho Petaluma was stripped bare. And in 1849, after Mexico conceded control of California, Vallejo, you know, he accepts American citizenship, joins the the legislature, uh, yeah. you know, helps craft that law, and then he becomes the two-term mayor of Sonoma, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Sonoma, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. what, well, he, what? That's why I say well, he was this Machiavellian guy, at our, and he saw the Americans coming. By the 1844, 1843, he already was welcoming Americans, because a lot of... Americans coming into California at the time, they couldn't be Mexican citizens. They couldn't own land unless they married a so-called Californio, and that's a woman who was uh, Spanish but born and raised in Alta California, like uh, Vallejo was. 
if you married a Californio, then you were essentially made a Mexican citizen and able to own uh, land and land grants. And so there are a lot of Americans who are coming to the states to, to Alta California and doing that. And he welcomed that. And he, and Mexico was, um, the whole Mexican uh, government in this state of Alta California, as I say, was just really chaotic. And uh, he had fallen out with the current governor. His, his nephew became the governor for a short while, and then he fell out with the next governor. And some of that had to do with, um, you know, his uh, wrangling of getting more land. Essentially, he had 66,000 acres that he was given as a grant. And, a, and at the beginning, he was supposed to distribute that to Mexican settlers. They were trying to settle this and attract people from Mexico here, but they wouldn't come up. So he established, he distributed a lot of the land to uh, the military guys in his unit and whatnot. Um, but he sold and then a lot he was to supposed American to by settlers. The governor, and the, the governor who did this in 1835 was part native himself, it turns out. He was supposed to um, distribute a lot of the land to the native Me Coast Miwok that were here, and there were 80,000 acres out in Olin Poly that were earmarked for that. And uh, Vallejo and his brother sort of did a sly hand with them for about five years. In about 1839, 1840, they had a revolt against him, and he gave them a little bit of land and a cow, a couple cattle and things like that, a piece, but he was just buying time. And he and his uh, brother, his cousin, uh, were trying to get the, the land for themselves. So in the early 1840s, the governor came into power at that time, sort of screwed Vallejo and sold the land out from under him without Vallejo knowing it. So there was a lot of this Machiavellian stuff and power plays just constantly going on at the time. And I think that Vallejo saw the Americans as relief from the whole corruption uh, in the Mexican government. Yeah, to, to give you an idea of how much property that was, uh, if you can remember where Olin Poly was, if you it's it's uh, south of here uh, along Highway 101, and that stretched all the way out to Tamales Bay. And uh, that was all under uh, Vallejo's control once he came here. Uh, it was deeded to him by the Mexican government, which had no right to give him any of that when you get right down to it. But uh, And then uh, from Olin Poly out to Tamales, that was originally supposed to be the Miwoks' property. And uh, they never took possession of it, though. They never really got a shot at it. Does that sound correct? Yes. Yeah. That's how it went down. So it was pretty sad in a lot of ways. Um, and the other thing that happened is when, when they, they, they secularized the missions, um, they tried to distribute some of the property to the natives in terms of the cattle that they had for working in the mission all those years. Well, a lot of the natives, I mean, we just talked about the kind of cultures that came out of, they weren't cattle ranchers. No. They didn't see the world like that. They didn't parcel it up into land grants and whatnot, that this was my farm and that's your farm. Um, so they really didn't want to be involved, and they had no place to live either at the time. So where were they going to take their cows? So Vallejo offered to take their cows and manage their cows for them in exchange for their labor at Petal Adobe, which is kind of a strange deal, but that's how he kept a lot of the workforce at the Adobe, essentially, is they worked for him, and in exchange, he managed their cattle. He took care of their cows. Oh, yep. Jeez. Really great guy. And then, you know, the, the controversial thing with the 1838 smallpox epidemic. Yeah. Um, it still remains an open question why he didn't inoculate uh, the natives working at the Adobe. Because in 1838, um, they actually had a cure for that. They had an inoculation against yes. smallpox. Yeah, and he didn't offer yes, that to the Indians. In fact, we'd had a smallpox epidemic 10 years before in 1828. And the Mexicans said, there was a guy named James Patty who came to San Diego with his dad and some other some other guys uh, from the Southwest. Uh, they came in illegally. They were thrown in jail as illegal immigrants by the Mexicans. But they found out they had a vaccine for smallpox, and they knew how to administer it. So in exchange for uh, their letting Patty go, they essentially assigned him to ride up the El Camino Real from San Diego all the way to San Francisco, inoculating everybody in all the missions. 
the military, the clerics, and all the natives that were working in the missions. And he did that. He inoculated like 12,000 people in 1828. Um, and the vaccine was made available by the Russians. That's who brought it to essentially the Spanish at the time. So 10 years later in 1838, it started in Fort Ross, the smallpox epidemic, and Vallejo sent one of his guys to Fort Ross to bring back a bunch of supplies with some Native Americans uh, traveling with him. And he, the, the guy came back, the corporal came back with smallpox. And it immediately spread through uh, Petal Adobe and then through Sonoma. Uh, Vallejo uh, inoculated all of the Californios, plus his Native ally, Chief Solano, but he didn't inoculate anybody else in Petal Adobe and Sonoma, and they died uh, almost overnight. And then the whole epidemic just spread through Sonoma, Napa, up through Clear Lake and all the way to Mount Shasta, apparently. And didn't we lose almost 80% of the Native Americans at that point? Yeah, it, it took out... The, the numbers are still up in the air. Vallejo was given to exaggeration in his memoirs. <laughs> he claimed that 70,000 Natives died. A lot of people have disputed that, but there were thousands who died because of it. And they think that the... Uh, Smallpox didn't go south of Sonoma County or Marin County because that James Patty had inoculated people 10 years earlier all the way to San Francisco. Is there speculation uh, why Vallejo would not have inoculated these people? None at all. And um, as I said, a couple of years ago, they came out with a translation of the Russian documents at Fort Ross at the time. And the Russians inoculated everybody when the smallpox started they lost four natives there in their in their colony in fort ross and there was probably i don't three to hundred to five hundred people there at the time and they in the documents they question what vallejo was thinking because this was his workforce this was the factory force for him and the the source of all his wealth essentially it uh with the tallow and the hide company so after the disease had spread quite a ways um, Vallejo did write letters to Monterey, to, to the Mexican government headquarters in Monterey, saying we've got a terrible epidemic up here. You guys have got to get ready for this, get some vaccines going. And the governor at the time wrote back and said, we can't find any vaccine right now. But they weren't interested. They didn't take any actions. And the smallpox never went south. So some people think that Vallejo wrote that much after the fact because he was covering... You know, he's coming his butt, essentially. Uh, some sad things, um, his his brother, Salvador, and uh, another member of his military unit wrote that uh, there were so many deaths here and there was no burial that the hills were just littered with white bones, uh, which is just a shocking sight to think yeah. about at the time. Absolutely. And this <laughs> this is the problem. Uh, if you're someone like me that grew up in, in this in this area and love it so much, when you realize um, what it took uh, to make this space available for oh, the Yankee settlers and, and uh, all of the heroes that I heard about growing up, uh, the McNears and Keller and uh, oh, Meacham and, and all of the people, Wickersham, and, and uh, none of this would have happened uh, had that not have happened. And, and this... Uh, it's, it's, it's been tough for me to square, and I kind of shoved that back in the back of my head, and then your book came out last year, and, and I know, I remember I called you just after I'd read it and said, geez, John, I'm never going to be able to remember this place the same way again, and, uh, and, it, and it's, it's tough to even talk about now, and that's, yeah. uh, and th this scene that happened in Petaluma uh, happened across this whole, this entire country, uh, our history is written by the victors, so we hear uh, until now when when this stuff is starting to finally come out. But we hear about all of the glorious victories uh, that Americans had uh, in, in forming this country. But we forget uh, uh, who the losers were. And the losers were very, very important people and with, with an incredible history and just a beautiful way of, of sharing the land, especially in California, especially in this area, they had found a way to peacefully coexist and and live in balance, pretty much with with the nature itself. 
And this is a sad part of our history here. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I have to say, when I, I started with the book, um, I started writing it, I, I started by writing about the early uh, experiences of the natives, and I put that down. It, it, much like you're saying, Tom, as soon as I came in contact with a lot of the information, which I didn't know, I was, I was too moved to deal with it. And I went out and read, I wrote the entire book, and then at the end I went back and I wrote um, the early section about the early ones, as we called it, about the Coast Miwok natives. And I have to say, I, I, I struggled with that whole section. I cried through a lot of it, just writing it. I, I've never had that experience before in my life. It was just, it was really a painful thing to, to and I, I hope I didn't come off as painting it too rosy. I, it was not a perfect society that they had by any means, but, um, no, they were humans. Wow, what a contrast that I never, I never understood things were like that before. I, you know, I grew up, like you said, with the story that, this was a wilderness until the American settlers came here, basically, you know, and they took the place away from the Mexicans who were kind of struggling to make things happen. And we created this whole universe, and it was just savages, and, and we made civilization out of it. Yeah. And I just had no idea no, well, what well, things were like before that storyline. You know, when we were in fourth grade and we went to see, uh, I remember when we went to the, to the missions, and they showed us how the, uh, the bricks were made, and they talked about how they had brought the Indians in from the hills and, and taught them about uh, Christ and God and all of that and, and made them good Catholics. In those days, it seemed like a great thing. I remember those stories, and it felt like all was right with the world. Um, and that's the way it was presented to us as kids. And uh, it wasn't all right with the world. It was uh, children were being separated from, as we walked through the, bar the barracks there, the the dormitories where the, where the children lived, um, they didn't mention that those kids had been kidnapped from their families uh, right. to, to be taught how to be Catholics. And uh, the story that was was painted so as, as the perfect picture for us as kids, and that's the way it was uh, growing up. And, and uh, it, it's tough when you when you realize, no, actually it didn't quite go that way. And that's... Yeah, and I, I, you know, and, and the sad thing, in retrospect, what I've learned in my research is that the Franciscans who came here on what they called the Sacred Expedition to convert the heathens, as they called them, to Christianity, they were, in many ways, they were humanistic compared to the Mexican government and the military. They really saw these as people, and they saw them as people with souls that were lost souls that they were going to do their best uh, to convert to Christianity. Once they secularized the missions, the military, people like Vallejo, he, he was completely secular. He didn't have that same attitude toward the natives. He saw them as basically slaves, as serfs, working his factory. Um, and that's, that's where the value of those lives really diminished. There was a huge battle between the Franciscans and the military in the 1820s and 30s. Um, and the other thing, we talk about smallpox, but before the smallpox epidemic hit here in 1828, the, the biggest uh, reason for deaths among the natives that had contact with the, the Spaniards and the Mexicans was syphilis. And that's because, you know, Spain and Mexico did not send their best to California. This was sort of like going to Siberia if you were in the military. You were sentenced here as being a bad guy. So the, the Franciscans did in many missions, and they weren't all saints either, but in many missions, they did their best to keep the military guys away from the native women. They would often, like, lock, even over in Sonoma, lock them up in a separate dormitory to protect them, but that wasn't enough. Um, so it, it's very sad, the whole situation. And, and then when Vallejo and his cronies come in, it goes downhill really fast for the natives. Um, not that they had a good situation with, with the Franciscans, but certainly better than what followed. Um, you know, and I think this is the other this is the other thing about legends and myths that you grow up with. Uh, they're very important because they they reflect something about how a community defines itself that we carry forth, like Tom and I did growing up and hearing these early stories when we were in grammar school about Vallejo and and the Petaluma Adobe and whatnot, but. You know, they 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 use facts very selectively, um, essentially. So if something in the storyline doesn't fit in, it's excluded, or it's buried, or else it's lost 
to history. And so part of what historians do, and, and the beauty of history is history is about investigation. It's about inquiry. It's delving into the parts of the past that are either lost or hidden. And sometimes that's very unsettling, as this as this section of this book was for me and obviously for Tom, because it challenges our, our uh, common lore and our common legends that we hold here. But I think at the same time, for me at least, it enlarges my understanding of the past. Um, you know, and the past is always with us. It's both a gift and a burden. And and if you don't appreciate that, it's like Mark Twain said about the past, you know, it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And you see these patterns. What I saw in the book is these patterns coming back over and over throughout that last, last 200 years, essentially, of this Petaluma watershed. And and I have a whole different perspective of Petaluma now that I had when before I, I started working on the book. I want to switch gears to another part of Petaluma's history that I was totally unaware of before this book, and that is the Chinese community that lived here in the mid-19th century. Yes, well, we had a Chinatown, and, yeah. um, you know, the Chinese came over to work the mines like everybody else. This was called Gold, California was called Gold Mountain in China, and... Um, after the mining experiences, a lot of them were brought to Sonoma County to work the vineyards um, by the Hungarian nobleman who set up Buena Vista uh, Winery uh, in the 1850s, and he employed the Chinese, and they became these very expert vineyard workers. And they essentially established the wine, the wineries of California and Sonoma County, at least. Uh, it was very important. And then, of course, they went to work in the railroads as the railroad started uh, being built here. And they also worked as servants at a lot of the, the wealthy homes in Petaluma. So they had a, um, a just for the background, they had a, a Chinatown that uh, in the 18, through the 1870s, uh, 18, early 1880s, was located where the McNair buildings are right now on Petaluma Boulevard yeah. near Western Avenue and extended over to B Street and a little bit toward C Street along the boulevard. Uh, and then there was um, there was a recession in the early 80s, and a lot of people felt that the Chinese, because they were cheap labor, they were undercutting other people, white workers essentially, and there was an anti-Chinese lake formed in Petaluma and other parts of Sonoma County to drive them out. And there was, the government passed an exclusion act excluding any more Chinese from immigrating here from China. But things got very tense in Petaluma because of the labor market. And um, John McNair, who employed a lot of Chinese, he had a, a brick factory down in Marin, and he also had a big shrimping operation down in Marin. Um, he stood up for the Chinese labor because he didn't want to pay more money for laborers, basically. And he was shouted down in town. And there was a, there was a meeting that was held in 1886 uh, down in Petaluma uh, by the town clock today, 2,000 people turned out to support a boycott against all businesses, all Chinese businesses, all Chinese labor, and any business like McNear's that hired Chinese laborers. And they drove the Chinese out of Petaluma's Chinatown. Uh, they all fled. And there was, uh, we've talked about this in the past, there was this unfortunate murder a former yeah. Petaluma uh, Captain Jesse Wickersham and his wife at their ranch, remote ranch up at Cloverdale, very, and from, they a, had from a, a very cook. from a very wealthy family. So these these were known. Very wealthy family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the uh, he was the son of uh, Isaac Wickersham, who was the richest man in Sonoma County at the time, big banker in Petaluma. And this just this was like the final uh, you know spark that lit the whole anti Chinese situation. It all happened at the same time. And the cook disappeared. They found the bodies in the farmhouse and the cook had disappeared. And they pointed the finger at the cook as being the murderer. And um, that spread all over the country. It, it turns out now people have investigated that deeper. And it's very doubtful that it was the cook, but he was pinned for the murder. So he the had actually, driven out. that cook had actually escaped and made it all the way back to China. And then was they put, think that the guy who was the cook made it back to China. He made it to Yokohama, and then he actually was arrested there yeah, on a request back. of uh, President Grover Cleveland, and he died in his cell. Um, 
but they're not 100% sure that was the actual cook. And they say that um, he, he hung himself in that jail cell. Right. But there's another story where he actually fled down to Fresno area uh, and was never seen again. Never seen again. Um, so it's, you know, it was one of those propaganda things that was just, it just ignited this huge storm. They had a huge labor shortage here in Sonoma County because they didn't, the white workers would not take a lot of the jobs that the Chinese had. Very similar to what we're facing here. So the Chinese came back in even greater numbers, and they established a Chinatown on Petaluma Boulevard South between C and D streets. That was the Chinatown. Um, And in 1900, a virus came to San Francisco aboard an Australian ship, and it was carried by fleas on rats. And it made its way to Chinatown in San Francisco. And so the mayor and the governor were very worried about it, so they quarantined Chinatown. Um, And they tried to deny there was actual plague going on there. But word got out, and because we had our, the the people who lived in Chinatown and Petaluma uh, did a lot of commerce with Chinatown and San Francisco. So the Chinese weren't happy with being quarantined. They filed suit against the government for discrimination. The governor joined them because The governor was trying to deny that there was any epidemic at all because it would hurt tourism in California. I mean, there are so many parallels to our current moment between the racism, the xenophobia, the denial of reality to save face. It's it's absolutely just mind blowing. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. It's what I was saying before. You know, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. (laughs) (laughs) What Twain said, and you just see these patterns over and over. And the governor. The governor lasted almost two years by denying the plague. And essentially what happened is finally started spraying the white people in San Francisco and further, and people started freaking out. And it wasn't until he lost the next election and they elected a physician as the governor that they actually clamped down on the plague and put an end to it, essentially. But very similar, very similar. And, the, you know, it didn't come from the Chinese, this plague. It had. It didn't care who, what race you were. It was going to affect anybody. It just happened to hit Chinatown first. I'm so struck by that because, of course, it. You know, there has been an attempt to, you know, bring race into this current uh, pandemic that we're facing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what you see is that when, um, when disease like this spreads, as people circle the wagons, they get fearful, and prejudice comes out of that. That's what you see from the 1900 story. You know. And then it, it becomes especially true when leaders like the governor at the time um, really try to conceal or suppress the facts. And, and they also delay mitigating it. Like he could, they could have stepped in, uh, aside from just quarantining China, Chinatown, they could have stepped in and tried to deal with it at the time. But instead they just tried to sweep it under the rug, essentially. Um, and then they assigned you know, this racist name to it for political gain, essentially. Um, Very similar game plan, essentially. 100%. Um, yeah. So, uh, Tom, I don't know if you have anything to add to that segment. No, but you know, if I ever, there are several points in Petaluma's history that I would love to go back and visit. And uh, I would, <laughs> if I had a chance, I would have loved to spend some time in one of Petaluma's Chinatowns, uh, in particular the one on 4th Street. It was the original. It was it was a burgeoning little community. There was a lot going on. There was a ton of culture. And it would have been a cool thing to see in its time. So that's always been one of those earmarks in Petaluma that I'd like to wish I could go back and look at. Yeah, I think there was, you know, just reading about the Chinatown in 1900 on the boulevard there, and it's basically where the theater district is now. Um, it was pretty lively. They had, a, they had their own Mason's Lodge, although the, the white Masons would not acknowledge them as Masons. They had their own temple. It's called a Joss House. House, yeah. and it was a um, it was a Buddhist um, Taoist temple that they prayed in, had events in. Um, they had laundries in town. They had restaurants in town. They had a lot of merchant communities going in town, and also behind the scenes, they they had places along East Washington Street by the river there, by Washington Street Bridge. They had opium dens going on. They had gambling parlors as well that uh, caused a lot of problems because a lot of the white men like to go to these places. Yeah, um, and, and I and I gotta chime in. That's part of what I, I just to see that 
style of, of uh, debauchery. I, I would have loved to see that for a night. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, so we, it was pretty rich, and yet yeah. we had this um, at B Street and the Boulevard, where that empty lot is next to uh, Rex now, there was something called the Chinese Mission School that was taught by um, people in Petaluma from the Congregational Church. And it turns out um, that the purpose of the school, they, they, they trained people in English and in Christianity. And a lot of them were servants to the wealthy houses on D Street, essentially. And um, the purpose was not to assimilate the Chinese into our culture. It was to train them as missionaries to go back to China and proselytize to save the heathens. And this school was a block away from the Chinese own temple, the Josh house, which just strikes me as one of those other just incongruous situations that they refuse to acknowledge the spirituality or the religion of these people and uh, essentially saw them as heathens. Very much like what happened with the Indians and the Spanish Franciscans. Another rhyme. Now, I don't know that this is in the book, but John, you have been doing some research more recently on the African-American community that lived in Petaluma during this same time period. Yeah, we had a, a, a pretty lively um, African-American community from about 1855 to about 1880. Um, and, uh, and it was comprised of, of, of um, people from two backgrounds. Um, some were freed black men, and women who came from the North um, and migrated here in the 1850s. George Miller was a very prominent person. 1855, he came here with his wife and two kids and um, established a barber shop. Uh, so um, barbers were one of the professions that blacks went into at the time. They had learned the trade working on the plantations and the plantation owners farmed them out to other white men to, to do barbering. And they, he came to set to California, and um, they were sort of uh, very prominent positions because your clientele were white. And a lot of times they were politicians and businessmen, and they would congregate at the barbershop because that was a place where guys hung out in the day to get their, their beards trimmed and their hair trimmed. Um, and so a lot of blacks um, really learned the ways of politics and business there, and George Miller was one of them. And, and they were looked upon well by the, the white clientele, and they had prominent positions. So what George Miller did is the other group that came over came to California as slaves, the Southerners came to the mines. And a lot of them were given the opportunity to work their way to freedom through the mines, either working for their uh, owners or working nights and weekends where they would make their own money in the mines and buy their way to freedom. And a number of uh, those uh, blacks also came to Petaluma at the time. A lot of them worked as laborers in Petaluma. But George Miller, and there was a couple other black barbers in town, and he had his barber shop on Main Street uh, across from Starbucks, where that parking lot is right next door to the Steiger building. It was called the Town Building. Oh, actually, George Miller had his, had that, that was where the other, Frank Miller had his barber shop there. George Miller had his barbershop at Lala's, the ice cream shop. And George Miller became a big player in San Francisco and in uh, California for the black associations. They had this colored convention every year that he went to as a delegate. And he also worked here to start the first uh, school for black kids in 1864. They opened one on Washington Street, East Washington Street. And he also worked to start the first black church was the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the ME. And that house is still standing. It's at 109 Howard Street. It's at Howard and Western Street. It's the first house going north uh, behind what used to be Bacala's Grocery, Bacala's grocery. essentially. Now, was that, and that, that was their spiritual place. That was their church? Yeah. I thought it was a school. That was a church? That was the church. Ah. And then there were other schools. I mean, this is a long story about separation. There were separate but equal um, laws passed about educating black children, and they had a school at Fifth and D Street, essentially, in the backyard of George uh, of John McNear's mansion, which kind of blows me away, was this black school, all-black school, uh, that was segregated at the time. But they had a pretty... Um, they had a pretty lively community here, and um, 
One of the differences between Petaluma and Santa Rosa is a lot of the blacks that came to Santa Rosa came with their owners from the South, and they were still in servitude in Santa Rosa. Petaluma were mostly freed blacks. When you look at the census, they were living independently in 1860 um, before the Civil War here. So So Petaluma got to be known as a very friendly union town for blacks. And um, they had a pretty robust community here for a long time until the 1870s. Uh, Reconstruction ended and uh, sort of racism started coming in. It started coming in around the black school here in Petaluma. Petaluma refused to integrate the schools. Uh, It was one of the lone cities in all of California to do that by 1876. And also what was happening when Reconstruction ended, there was a lot more racism coming on across the country. Um, And the blacks were congregating around Vallejo, the town of Vallejo, to work in Mirror Island, which was just shipyards, and also they were congregating in Oakland. And that was seen as safer safer communities. So uh, we had just a a lot of our black citizens just moved to Vallejo and and Oakland, and, and that that whole community is kind of shut down by the early 1880s. Yeah, but, you know, I want, I want oh. to backtrack oh, and the just a little bit. The great thing that George Miller did, too, I forgot, is he, we, had these, um, we had these militias in town after the Civil War, and they would march in all the parades and whatnot, and um, there had been an Irish militia during the Civil War here, the Emmett Rifles. And so this guy, James Marshall, formed the, the Houston militia in 1869, and he was an abolitionist. And he was a friend of, he got his hair cut by George Miller, obviously, and so he encouraged George to start his own black militia in Petaluma, and he did. And so Petaluma had its own black militia, and they marched in all the parades, and they had their own armory over by um, the bridge on Washington Street by the river there, and um, and they marched down in San Francisco as well, representing Petaluma as this black militia. So I want to backtrack a little bit. Um you mentioned that in the 1850s and on up through the early 60s, uh, there were blacks working in Santa Rosa that were still in servitude. Uh, is that right? Is, does that mean that they were slaves? Yes. In Santa Rosa, the so people there was a there was an action passed here when we became a free state. Um, when, we, when we were admitted to the Union, in California, 1850, we were yeah. a free state, but uh, slave owners were allowed to come into. Uh, California with their slaves for a period of time. Um, and there, there were a lot of things that went on during the mining period. Um, there were some acts that were passed, um, the Fugitive Law, uh, which was nationally passed in 1850, but yeah. 1852, California passed the Fugitive Law. A lot of the b- freed blacks didn't have proper paperwork that they were free. And bounty hunters came into California, and they would kidnap free blacks and take them back to the South and sell them back into servitude, essentially, as slaves. So a lot of that was going on as well. It was very sketchy times here if you were an African-American in the 1850s. I hadn't heard that yet, and uh, that's, boy, that's sobering. I want to uh, talk about the three explosions that Tom wanted to draw attention to. <laughs> Tom, Tom likes murders, and Tom likes explosions. And so I, I'd, lo- I'd love to do the trifecta of, well, of, of explosions that, that grabbed you. And, John, you can fill in when you want. Well, it's uh, not explosions, per se. No, let's see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, it, I think it is. <laughs> okay. Well, this is referencing uh, one of my first and favorite uh, historical documents or books about Petaluma. Uh, was written written by uh, an incredible woman named Adair Adair Laura Adair Laura. And I just want to say before you go into this, uh, everything we just talked about with Petaluma's African American community is not in John's book, but there have been articles, I believe, John, that you've written on the online Petaluma three hundred and sixty website. Uh, yeah, go correct. go into great detail. I believe there's one uh, January 16th, 2020, Petaluma's Black History Marked by Segregation. So if anybody is interested in more detailed information, that is available online. Please go uh, ahead. Anyway, the book by Adair Laura, uh, The History of Petaluma, a California River Town. Uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> I'm not sure this is a great segue. One of my favorite chapters was the steamboat catastrophes. And not just the steamboat catastrophes, uh, it, what struck me the most was when I read about uh, a train that had blown up uh, down at the foot of B Street. 
quite uh, close to where the Apple Box used to be, and it's now is it the Petaluma River Restaurant or? Uh, it's a great little it's a great little cafe now, but right there at the end of of of, of um, uh, B Street, there was a, a, a railroad engine that blew up because they had been pumping too much steam into their steamer, and uh, they they hadn't released it in time. This thing blows up and it killed four people. Actually, I think six people along the river, right in a spot that uh, we that several. I mean, if you're a downtown Petaluma guy, you walk by this spot every day maybe many times a week and you'd have no idea that uh boy about 110 years ago 120 30 years ago a, a, a train had blown up and killed six people right in that spot and uh <laughs> this is how histories of towns work you as as we live today we hear about these huge tragedies that are happening in other towns and you wonder how does the town ever recover from that but just in watching our own history, we realize every town has these. And not only does every town recover from it, every town forgets about it. And we just walk over these same spots over and over again. And down along the river, uh, there were several of those, uh, several catastrophes. There was a steamboat that blew up. The Georgiana blew up uh, at Western, the foot of Western Avenue. And that killed several people. And uh, that was just uh, through, that was because... Uh, uh, the owner of the boat was trying to uh, steam it up so that it could run a lot quicker. And uh, he, he blew too much steam. And this was Captain Thompson, I think was his name. And uh, his, uh, his uh, fireman, his onboard fireman was complaining about it. He goes, oh my God, this damn fool is going to blow this boat up and he's probably going to kill me. And if I get off this boat today, I'm never going to set foot on it again. Well, son of a gun, uh, he was blown off the boat that day and he did die. And as they were taking him away, he wasn't dead yet. He said, that damn fool Thompson killed me. <laughs> and, uh, and on that one, I think two or three people were killed at the foot of the Western, uh, 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 West, uh, Western Avenue. Uh, the railroad train that blew up. Uh, Before we get to that, uh, John, anything to add on uh, what Thomas said so well, far? I think from what I've read of the history, steamboat... Uh, Explosions were rather common at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of government regulation going on. These were all owned by people like Charles Minturn, who owned the Petaluma uh, steamers that ran through, as well yeah. as the railroad that I think you're going to talk about with John McNear at some point uh, yes. in town. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was just not a regulated industry by any means. Uh, a lot of inexperienced people, uh, a lot of people... Apparently, it was very popular for steamboat captains to race their steamboats with people on board. Uh, so it was a, it was the Wild West. It was, and and, and there was an incredible coincidence um, that befell uh, John uh, McNear, I believe, uh, the, the day that the uh, the railroad uh, engine blew up, the, the train engine blew up. Uh, on B Street, uh, he happened to have been bending over to tie his shoe, and <laughs> and he was one of the few people in the area that wasn't killed. Coincidentally, uh, the shrapnel blew over him, and that's what he said. If I hadn't bent over to tie my shoe, I I, it, I would have gone with everybody else. It would have killed him. Um, but the coincidence here is, and I'm not sure if it was his mother, but it was his father's uh, one of his father's, his father's first wife, and it might have been John's mother, but I don't know, was killed in an... No, in a, it was his son's first wife. It was his son's first wife? It was George P. McNear's uh, first wife. So, John's son, George P. McNear. Okay, so it was his son's first wife was killed in a steamboat accident uh, along the mm-hmm. road. And important to note, if you didn't listen to the second episode of these, uh, and if you don't know Petaluma <laughs> history, the McNear family, I mean, these were, what do you think, John, maybe the most prominent family of that time, or at least tied for <laughs> first or second yeah, place? There were one of five. There yeah. were like yeah, yeah. five major capitalists in town, and he was among them. And probably yeah. of them all, he was the most visionary in a lot of ways. Oh, the properties they built, the the warehouses and... and uh, um, the large buildings that still stand to today, the, the Petaluma Mill, the Great Petaluma Mill, uh, the location of, uh, boy, the Great Petaluma Mill uh, stands between uh, where the boat blew up, where the Georgiana blew up at the, at the uh, foot of Western Avenue, and where the railroad uh, train blew up on B Street. 
And this was a McNear building. I guess this all happened around. Uh, of course, the McNear building on Petaloon Boulevard, which houses the Mystic Theater, and took out, it, it was, uh, uh, if you go to the back side of that building, that's where the original Chinatown was in Petaluma. Uh, so he built this building all the way from B Street all, almost to Western Avenue, uh, from Petaluma Boulevard all the way back to 4th Street. And that building is, is one of Petaluma's most glorious buildings. It's, it's just a beautiful piece of history. And you can walk by and see that thing every day. And you had another explosion. Uh, was it a? Oh boy! Or is that all? No, there were there were actually three. And unfortunately, I've I've lost all my notes talking about the first section. Um, well, I mean, he mentioned John mentioned uh, Mintern, and I, this is somebody that you had some feelings about. Oh yeah, well he was Mintern was uh, Mintern was a was a, a boat captain who uh, capitalized on the passenger the steam ca- passenger business between San Francisco and Petaluma. And uh, when he saw the handwriting in the wall that it was going to be going to railroad soon, he jumped into that business. Um, and every time he'd jump into a business, he would do it uh, with both feet, and he'd go for blood. He was he was a <laughs> ruthless businessman. <laughs> and uh, he did have, and I can't remember which one of his boats did blow up, but one of his boats, uh, I think it was the Red Jacket or the Kate Hayes, uh, were in a race to make it back to Petaluma, and they were running their... Uh, uh, they they were running their steam heavy, and the fireman uh, on the boat that day, uh, in order to keep the steam going, was using an oar to hold down the steamer buttons, so that the steam would build up more and push more and get the get the uh, the boat moving quicker. And son of a bitch, if that boat didn't blow up and uh, kill several people with it, uh, that was the pilot. I think that was a boat called the pilot, maybe. And that boat, it blew the engine. But it didn't blow the boat up, and the boat actually was repaired and, and ran for many years afterwards. And this is all. Uh, this is in Adair's, Adair's book, isn't it? I think this is mostly in Adair's book. Yeah, and I've. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was well, going. Well, you back. know, the beauty of of Mintern and and what happened with McNear, McNear boarded, as you Tom said, Mintern decided he was going to build a, a railroad from Petaluma all the way down to essentially San Rafael to Black Point. And this is and, mid mid nineteenth um, century. Am I correct? Uh, right, yeah, okay. right. This was going to be the first railroad when railroads were really early. So he started building out of Petaluma. He only got two and a half miles to Haystack Landing, which is down by where the Dutra plant is right now. And that's that was the so boats would come to Haystack Landing because it was too shallow to come up to Petaluma still at the time, uh, and the river. That's as far as they could get, and they would have to take this little two and a half mile uh, rail steamer down to Haystack Landing, and that's what McNair was getting on that day to go down to board a boat in Haystack Lane to San Francisco. And um, it's ironic that he almost died on Minturn's train because, as Tom said, Minturn had two steamers running up and down the Petaluma River in the 1850s. He had monopolized the boat traffic, and McNair got set up with that and put his own boats out there to challenge Mintern essentially and and started undermining his monopoly so yeah, and he was charging the fact that half he would price. Then get on a Mintern train and almost lose his life is very ironic in a lot of ways because they were close they were clearly enemies in that way you know what and, and that's weird after the first part of this that could be considered the light material <laughs> yeah well i mean <laughs> that that's very true because there was another topic which seems like very light even though i think some people were killed in it which is uh the the brawl about the uh, the track rights in Santa Rosa, oh, and that yes. has that that has uh, overlap with Petaluma a bit. Yeah, well, that was the second time Petaluma went to war in, uh, with Santa Rosa, I think. Um, First time being, of course, the famous Washu House story, yeah, which we've, I think we've told five or six times on this show. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which is probably just a total myth itself. Yeah, so. well, it <laughs> might it have been. a lot about the relationships between the two cities. Yeah, yes, and, also, and it, it makes really it to the book, actually. The, the yeah. Washu House story has yep. its own page. I love that. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it, it does. But let's talk... I, I kind of discount it quite a bit, but it's it's symbolic. It's, it's one of those legends that speaks truth, even though the facts aren't there, okay? Yeah. Right. Let's hear about the second battle. Or, uh, well, the second battle, I, I don't know if you've got the background in for the names and, and all of that, but it had to do with, um, was it McNear even at the time that was trying to build a rail line that went all the way up to Healdsburg? Uh, they wanted to ship Redwood and, and uh, products from up there. Uh, and, and, no, uh, no, it's, um, it was the electric rail line. Ah, and it needed... So to- the uh, San Francisco 
the Northern Pacific line had come through already under Peter Donahue, and then Got he it. went. His son went bankrupt after Donahue died, and it was purchased by um, <clears throat> I think the Central Central Pacific Railroad at that point. Um, so what McNear did at that point. He was still trying to get away from the monopoly of the railroad, and they wanted to build an electric rail line, which was had just started up in Maryland, these electric lines, because in turn of the century, electricity and power plants had just really come into vogue, essentially, in Petaluma and whatnot. Yeah. So that's what he went out to raise money to do, and they built this Petaluma Santa Rosa Railway, which was, a, which was called the Juice Line, because it ran on electricity a line above the uh, car, and it ran from Petaluma up to Sebastopol, and then from Sebastopol to Santa Rosa. And the battle came when they tried, when they got to Santa Rosa, they tried to cross the tracks um, of the California railway, and they were blocked by the owner of that railway, a guy named Foster. Yeah, now he um, brought his a wealthy steam guy engine. Who also brought this big ranch down in Lakeville that William Beeler had bought at the time. So he and McNear got into this battle about allowing the electric train line to cross the tracks of the um, the regular rail that ran all the way up to Hillsburg and Ukiah, and uh, the California Northwest Rail Line, and that's where the battle started. Yeah, right, uh, right at the spot where I guess the, the tracks were to cross. Had they built right. the tracks, they built the tracks all the way up to, to the line that they needed to cross. And, uh, and and this is where the battle actually occurred, such as it was. Uh, I think, I don't know how many times a steam engine has been used as a weapon, but as I recall, that's that's how it went down. They uh, they ended up uh, pulling a steam engine up to the scene of the battle and then releasing steam on, on the combatants. Is that correct? Yeah, then they bring in cars full of sand and dump sand on the rails. So the juice line guys couldn't get the cars uh, away, across the line, essentially. They were doing all these maneuvers. And they drew, what was interesting, they drew this huge crowd of people to watch this whole thing <laughs> unfolding. Of course. And who won? <laughs> um, the uh, juice line finally won. Um, the main, the guy, the, the director of the juice line, working for McNear and whatnot, essentially laid his body on the tracks. And they brought the the California rail uh, locomotive to within inches. And they had two rails on both sides that were going to close off the tracks. And he laid his bodies down, and um, he got badly injured, but he survived. And uh, then there was a, a, I think they got a legal order, essentially allowed them to cross the tracks, and that, that's yeah. how they won. Yeah, I think it, it was, was a very dramatic scene, and the newspapers loved it. I mean, they were just reporting on it minute by minute, essentially. You know, I'm sure the telegrams are going crazy at the time. <laughs> How many were killed in this whole thing? Nobody died. I don't think no one died. died. Oh, no. very good. I was wrong. That's yeah. That's kind of the way it happened. We every time we went to war with Santa. A lot of people got burned there. though, pretty bad yeah. from the steam. From the steam. And they're shooting all those <laughs> blasts of steam, burning. Yeah. Uh, the guy who laid down um, was this McNair's partner was a guy named Frank Burns or Frank Brush. He was a Santa Rosa banker, and he would laid down on the tracks between the two approaching locomotives that are going to seal off the track. Yeah, that was pretty brave. And they just scorched him with hot steam. They burned his whole body. Wow. This guy, William Beeler, is fascinating to me. <laughs> just because he, he's, he's, a, he's a German immigrant, I believe, and he comes here and he... He what does he do? He like essentially like destroys a lake. Yeah, he dynamites. <laughs> <laughs> he does that. He like gets involved in what in like the railroad business. He's just jumping around doing all this di- this yeah. different stuff. And yet, I've never really seen any trace of him uh, in modern day in terms of like you know buildings or street names. Tom thinks there's a street I think name. There's a, isn't there a Beeler that comes off of one of the Lakeville, uh, Lakeville Highway Two or something like that? There might be a Beeler. Oh really? App. Somewhere out there, I've seen Beeler somewhere. But I'm so struck that this guy who, John, is all over your book. I mean, he's he's on like seven different sections, which is unheard of if you look at the index. Um, what is this guy's story? How did, he, how did he get here? How did he get so much power and why did he leave? Well, it's interesting you say this because this is one of the problems I have with the legends again. We've got five big capitalists in Petaluma at the time, like the McNears and the Wickershams and the Meachams and the Hills. 
And that's all we ever hear about in the legend. Here's a guy who was probably one of the wealthiest guys in the entire county among maybe six people, and he's never written about. Nope. And he's probably one of the most progressive, but he's a little, he's down in Lakeville. And you got to understand, Lakeville at the time was a little bit of mind out of sight for Petaluma. Petaluma is settled by a bunch of New England Protestants. And Lakeville, along with Sonoma Mountain, was where the Irish immigrants, which was the first big immigrant group to come here, my family among them, they were all secluded down in Lakeville. And so Beeler bought in Lakeville, and he made a big splash, but he didn't. they didn't pay a lot of attention to him in Petaluma. He wasn't a big bank or anything. But he came... Um, he came from uh, the, the East Coast when he was a very young man and came to San Francisco and worked to, basically for the gold rush, but he worked as a butcher. That's what he'd been trained at back in the East Coast. Um, and then he, from working as a butcher, he went up to Napa with a partner and they bought a cattle ranch and they made a go of it and they made a lot of money apparently. And then he also bought a huge cattle ranch up the coast uh, near Fort Ross at Stillwater Cove, just gigantic parcel of land, and was raising cattle and shipping it out of the Fort Ross area. He made a lot of money, and by 1859, he came to Petaluma, and he bought 8,000 acres from Vallejo. Now, Vallejo still had a lot of land, but he was really broke and poor, and he was selling it off in lots. So uh, Beeler bought 8,000 acres that extended from Lakeville all the way over to Sonoma, essentially. And it cut through, as we were talking, it included uh, Tole Lake. Um, and right now, if you go down to Lakeville, he built this beautiful Victorian home that's still there. It's a yellow home yes. on Lakeville Highway on the right. That's that low line. Down. It would be a low line. It's not even a two-story, is it? Is, is it a single story? No, it's, it's just a single story. He it's was beautiful. a lifelong bachelor. Beautiful. You know, he had maids yeah. and stuff. But it's a beautiful home, and it's yeah. been restored now by the family that lives there. Um, but the other thing that he did was 8,000 acres. He set out to raise cattle and draft horses. And that was, uh, you know, they had all these longhorn cattle here from the Spanish, which it was not very good meat and whatnot. It was, they are mainly for hides, so... Beeler and other people started importing really top-grade cattle from the East Coast, um, as well as draft horses. And um, he became one of, Petaluma became one of the, became the center of uh, draft horse, yeah. uh, draft horses in the whole West Coast, essentially, thanks to Beeler and a couple other people, essentially. So he had that going. He was the first guy uh, in the Petaluma Valley to plant grapes on his ranch down there after he drained Tole Lake. He planted potatoes and beets, and then I, now, people say, yeah, they converted See, here's the thing, here's to, the thing. To, to you, just, the way, you just kind of just kind of did this aside. After he drained Tole Lake, he went ahead and, how did he go about draining Petaluma Lake, uh, the Tole Lake? Well, there was a natural dam at the southern end, and he dynamited it, so it flowed out into San Pablo Bay. And... The Tole Lake was actually what they call a sag pond. It sits in a um, it sits in a, a a fault line where water collects. So there are natural springs that feed it, yeah. and there there was a creek, a Tole Creek, that fed into it. And so it was just naturally dammed there in this kind of fault line uh, indention. And, and and when you're up there, you can really see it. So he just he just blew up the natural dam at the southern end of the lake and it flowed out in the San Pablo Bay and he drained it and then he got frustrated apparently with the way his potatoes were growing around the lake and he thought the lake bed would be more uh, fertile conducive to growing good potatoes and did he own that property that he blew up the dam on oh, oh yeah he owned 8,000 acres and what, I mean he which is which is all the, his property went all the way to Sonoma from from the Petaluma River there 12 and a half uh, square miles yeah. just, un, just yeah, imagine incredible. that so he a major player, and like you're saying, um, he, he, Jim, that he just didn't get any recognition after, it, during his lifetime, he certainly got a re- lot of recognition, yeah. but uh, not in the history books. It's just, mm. ma- it just makes you wonder. I guess he didn't have close proximity to the ones who were writing the books, or maybe he wasn't a part of the, like, you know, popular aristocracy of uh, well, Petaluma, right. those he big He was five. German, that's one problem. And yeah. the aristocracy on D Street... 
uh, no knocks against them, were Protestants from New England, yeah, from basically. New England. And that's yeah, the how they all, is, it, they went to the same churches, um, they went to the same fraternities, you know, the, the Oddfellows Lodge, the Masons Lodge. It, it was a really close clique. And you won't find, I found like three Irishmen in that clique, and that was it. Um, but the, as I say, the Irish were pretty much segregated out of that. There were no Italians. There were a handful of Jewish merchants in Petaluma. That's a really interesting group of people, too. Yeah, it is. Uh, we didn't talk about the other murder, Tom, Isaac Diaz. I think well, one of your it, favorite murders. You know what? It is one of my favorite murders. And, and uh, Let's you know, talk about that. Because I have such a bad taste in my mouth every time, you know, every time I hear someone call this a chicken town. And Isaac <laughs> Diaz, actually, uh, Isaac Diaz was a big part of that. John, could, could you would you fill us in with that one? Well, you know, um, the Lyman Vice story is tied into the Isaac Diaz. So, yes. and I've just found some infer- interesting information about um, Lyman Vice uh, coming from um, Adair uh, Lara Hay. Um, so Lyman Vice came here from Canada as a young man because he had health issues. He was in medical school back there. He went to see the dentist. The dentist was named Isaac Diaz. He was a Jewish man here in Petaluma. And as a hobby on the side, he was inventing chicken incubators, egg incubators. And he'd come up with a really good incubator. Now the incubators are out there, but no one had really figured out sort of the magic, the secret sauce yet. And he had one. And so, um, Bice apparently had fooled around with incubators himself back in Canada as a young man. And so they kind of hit it off and they started working on, on Diaz's incubator. So um, Diaz was a very cultivated man, too. A lot of the Jewish merchants uh, were very much in the theater. They started in 1870 when he was here. He was one of them. They started the first theater in Petaluma, which uh, we call the Opera House now on Kentucky Street. Yeah. It's where McGuire's pub is located. Yeah. Um, and that was the main theater from 1870 till 1904 when the Phoenix, then the Hill Opera House opened up. Uh, and they, the Jewish uh, merchant group of which he was part and the professionals, they had the Pedal and Literary Association. And they were very much the theater and culture. And that's why they started that particular theater. So very intelligent, cultivated man. He went out with this incubator to the state fairs and whatnot, and Bice was sort of his partner at the time, but when you look at all the documentation, the state fair, the incubators always listed are Isaac Diaz. So paper, and he had the patent to it, and then he put Bice onto the patent with him at some point, and they were going to start this incubator company. So Isaac Diaz goes duck hunting down the Petaluma River with his buddy, and they separate at some point, and Diaz is in the little rowboat with his shotgun uh, on alone, uh, hunting in one part of the slough, and he puts in to shore somewhere. And apparently, as the story goes, um, he's reaching to get the gun uh, from the by the barrel end, and there's something that gets the trigger gets hooked on in the boat, and uh, the gun goes off and blows his head off. That's basically the story. Now, there's a lot of suspicion about how he died, how that would happen. Um, but what happens after that is Bice essentially takes full credit for inventing the incubator. And Bice was a very uh, entrepreneurial guy. You know, nothing against Bice, but it wasn't his invention. But he claimed he wrote the us out of the story. Yeah. And then he was really good at marketing and promotion. And, and the incubator took off, as we all know. Yeah. What a dear... Uh, Lara Hay found out when she was re- researching her book, and I have the, the correspondence, she wrote back to the schools in Canada to get his records in the medical schools. He was never enrolled in any of them. Wow. There are no records of him. So it looks like he falsified his background, too, when he came here. Well, he kind of reinvented himself. Yeah, and that was unusual for guys like that. Um who came to Petaluma at that time, and there was no internet. They weren't going to trace you, you know? You couldn't check him out. You could not there's Google there's always these suspicions names. about how Diaz died. It's such a strange death for, yeah. for such an uh, intelligent man. Yeah. And anybody who, and I've duck hunted when I was a kid with my dad down in the blinds down there. Nobody picks up their gun by the barrel. The barrel. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
It does not happen. It's, it's quite unusual. And Tom, why is it your favorite murder? Just because it's got that intrigue? It's got that question yes. mark? Yes, it does. It's got that question mark. It's, uh, it's, it's such a, a piece of Petaluma history. And it's the, it's the very piece of Petaluma history that takes a whole piece of the puzzle out. Um, until we brought him up uh, on this show tonight, I wonder how many people have actually ever heard that there was a partner with, with uh, Lyman Bice, and his name was Isaac Diaz. And quite frankly, uh, he, he might have been the one that invented the incubator that turned Petaluma into the eight capital of the world for a period, which is why everywhere you look in this town, you're bound to see a picture of a chicken. <laughs> which, yep. gee... When I, I think that's the sad thing we didn't talk about. I mean, I, you know, I think getting beyond the chicken legend is really vitally important. Yes. You know, as we talked about in previous episodes, the Rivertown era is extremely rich. Yes. But one of the, I think, fatal flaws in Petaluma's history is that we've had this gold mine mentality since the very beginning when people came here. And we followed these kind of booms and busts. And California, uh, California was susceptible to that, but especially Petaluma. And from the very beginning, we went through just one monocrop after another. And it started with potatoes. That was the first monocrop. An Irishman brought some potatoes here and planted them out, out in Bodega and Bloomfield. And we became the potato shipping town. That all crashed once they exhausted, you know, they exhausted the soil. They overproduced. Then we went to this huge wheat boom. Everybody planted wheat, even if they had a dairy ranch or anything, they took all the cows off of it and planted wheat. That boom lasted to the 1880s. That's how the McNears made their money. Yeah. And then McNears' brother had a hand at, at manipulating prices, and that whole market crashed. And then we were we were looking for the next boom, and chickens came along. These incubators, because of Bice and Diaz, 1890, come on the scene. And McNear didn't want to become another monocrop. He warned against just becoming a chicken town. He wanted to build a factory town and diversify, yeah, and no right. one would listen to him. And instead, we went full in on chickens, and the chicken thing, you know, went through essentially the depression and everything crashed. And then, um, you know, after that, the dairy industry crashed, which was sort of secondary to, to chicken. So we've always been in these booms and busts at, at, in Petaluma, and it's just... It's still this gold mine mentality that goes on here, and that's how we ended up being a. Uh, and the next big, the next big boom uh, was to be a commuter town back in the late fifties and early sixties. This was, uh, I remember, at the south end of town. The sign said, "Welcome to Petaluma, Northern California's fastest growing community." And we were uh, being designed to be the bedroom community of San Francisco in those days. And here yep. we are. That was the boom. Yeah. And you were right in it. Your dad was part yeah, of that. The whole one at Del yes. Mar. Del that's, Mar development. You bet. Whatnot. That's he was, why I'm he living was, in Petaluma. Uh, a key player there. Yeah, he was. And that's, yeah, <laughs> son of a gun. Uh, and that's correct. I think all of us, the uh, Petalumans are, are usually ended up in Petaluma because of whatever boom they were attached to, I guess. That's exactly right. That's a very good insight. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> I think it'd be fun, Tom, in like 10 years for you and I to sit down and do an episode on your dad and do an episode on my dad. <laughs> okay. <that'd be laughs> but, oh, yeah. but we kind of probably wait a little while. Um, yeah. You know what? I, I think, would... Jim, your, your dad and your grandfather and your great-grandfather, yeah. who, he, he made his money on the chickens too, right? Well, you know, everybody did a lot of things, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but he was like, your great-grandfather was like a major chicken wholesaler in town he was but I, I i joke about that i say we did a lot of things because there was also rumor that my great-grandfather uh angelo Aegis, who raised i believe eight children here in petaluma i uh, believe uh he was rumored to be mob affiliated yeah that was in the, could have been. Yeah, could I, have been. I, I love I love the silence on your part. Like, yeah, yeah well, no, who knows? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there. Like, um, someone told me once that he would do that thing, like you see in mob movies, where he'd like go to San Francisco on business, walk into the place with the briefcase, and then walk out of the place with the briefcase. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, uh, he and, and he, you know, he was a character who didn't get doesn't get a lot of press in any of these histories that I see. But like, no, he doesn't. But a fascinating. And he was a major player too at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the. 
that wholesale market, that was huge. He was the main distributor here, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, he was a guy who wore a suit everywhere that he went. He was yep. a guy that, like, was uh, trained to play the mandolin. Um, he was a guy who immigrated over here from, I believe he was from Malta. I think his wife might have been Malta. from Italy. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, well, because Aegis is a Maltese name. That is the, wow. that is the heritage of the name. And, uh, yeah, it comes over here. His, his house that um, he built to house his big family is still standing at 210 West. Yeah, he, it's a beautiful Oh, yeah. And, it, and my father was best friends with your grandfather. And my father grew up in that house part of time. So yeah, and there's a, little, a lot of stories about that beautiful place. Uh, who, who was yeah. the architect that he hired to build that? Pretty famous woman. She's in this book. Yeah, that was um, Julia Morgan. Oh, yeah. and uh, It's a beautiful home. It's really it stunning. Yeah. I look forward to getting it back into the family in the next 10 years. Um, I think that would be wonderful. I always drive by it and think about that. And yeah. I know that during the war, when like your your grandfather and your, your great uncles went off to, to war, because my father was sort of one of the family, they put a star in the window for each soldier in the family who was at war, and they put a star in, your, in the window of the agent's house for my father, too. Oh. Yeah, and you know, it's funny you bring that up, because my uh, grandmother is still alive. She's the last remaining person of that guard. You know, all, all the uh, the eight siblings have all passed away, and uh, so my you know my grandfather's wife, my grandmother, Topsy Aegis, Topsy. still alive, and she brings up that star thing a lot. It, it meant a lot to, uh, your family meant a lot to my family, and still does, but, yeah. but back then I mean, it was... Topsy is my godmother, too, so it was very important. Uh, Topsy worked in this theater uh, for yes. Doc Nafee. Uh, Met when he Doc was, Nafee. When he yes. was the manager, and I believe that uh, below this stage, beneath the stage on which we sit, was the dressing room for the ushers. Yeah. So, my wow. God, my God, like, yes. she turns 92, I think, next month, so we're wow. probably talking, gosh, when she was in her teens. Uh, she was 10, well, feet, bu- 10 been, feet below us, probably, yeah. changing into her usher she, yes. outfit. Wow. Uh, wow. Yes. We got to get her on the show. <laughs> I'd love to. Absolutely. That would be, yeah. Um, you have a we one- need to do that just because, you know, we haven't delved into all the, the taverns in the grocery stores right. around town, which was another fascinating yes. subculture. I th- if we can get you back for a night, I would love to get into that because we can discuss once and for all the tunnel between Volpe's and the Phoenix and what I believe about that and what you proved for me i think but i i would i don't want to give that up yeah too much. Well, I, I, john i'd love to do another one of these with you if you would be interested sometime i think there's a, sure. a, a i think uh, what you just discussed would be a great topic and then there's just a, a lot of things we could go off of with that so i think probably tonight we've probably hit everything we should hit um any closing yeah, thoughts? you know jim i was just thinking as you were talking about your family background it'd be great to talk about some of these you know i've talked about my irish family the Swiss Italian is such a rich topic in Petaluma, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and even the German families from the Isle of Four and stuff. There, there's just, I think a lot of people would relate to that. I, I've noticed that, at least on Facebook and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of ways we can go into those stories, like talking about the grocery stores or the different merchant areas that different immigrants went into, you know? In the next episode, I want to talk about the, the theaters as well, because, of course, we're in the Phoenix, oh, yeah. and I think it'd be fun to really zoom in on it. Yeah. But I want to just ask yep. you one final hard-hitting question um, oh, that boy. I cannot wait till the next one. Why isn't Tom Gaffey in this book, in the theater section? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> because... Um, why isn't Tom Gaffey in the book? Well, because I think I, I belong in the future. I think we ended the book in the 1970s yeah. purposely. Yeah. Well, and when I, I wrote this huge, Tom's seen it, I wrote this huge history of all the theaters. Yeah. And uh, very detailed, very boring history. Yeah. But um, when I gave it to my editor for the book, she cut the last like half out. <laughs> she did. And I think that's why I couldn't work Tom back into okay, it because okay. it extended the, the Phoenix story beyond where the book ended. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I think it, it ended with it. I think the theater story ends with Finley again, where it started. And that's what my editor, oh. did. she cut it and did that. <laughs> that was a great place to, to frame it too. We, we will blame the editor. Yeah. Right? And Finley, Hey, Tom, Finley lives in Gatati near Oliver's. I is, found is out. Is he still alive? We, okay. I really uh, tempted uh, to go in and see the guy, you know, I just can't. 
I mean, hold on. I mean, okay, we're, I know we're wrapping this thing up, but like Finley, for people who don't have the the recall from the first episode, because we talked about Finley on the first episode. We did. Okay. What a character. What a what legacy. A yep. What a legacy, What yes. a story. Let, let's let, yes. let's tell that story for five minutes, and then we can and we can uh, leave and then come back in a month or two. But uh, Finley, he he had to go on trial for. Oh, was that yeah. for showing the showing the, um, not behind the green door, the deep throat, deep throat, yes, deep throat at the Mystic Theater. And I think he ended up in in the Guinness Book of World Records for that as well. Uh, so what were oh, they I think doing? So too, I think you're right. Yeah, they, long, they, they were what run. they were running it over and over and over. Yeah, and over they, there? it was the only film they ran for uh, a period of time. Five years. Five years, and I think it went it went on records being the longest running movie and in, in, uh, uh, showing at any time. He he purchased the State Theater from the this Kini is Alan family. Alan Finley. Okay. And um, it just made a lot of money to show porn, so he he converted the state into a porn yeah. theater. And right, well, he, he actually owned all the theaters in town, and yeah, he, he did bought he bought oh, the yes. state theater from Dikini. He also bought yes. the Parkway Drive-in from Dikini. Yes, he did. He was running porn out there, uh, up and on, and then he leased the showcase in '73 yeah. from Dikini yeah. when Tom and I were graduating from high school. Yeah. Um, and and I found ads in the old Argus's where he was running porn on the weekends and stuff at the showcase. I guess he was. I you which know, is this building for anybody yeah, who doesn't know. That. It is. It was. Yeah, the showcase is the Phoenix Theater, and this was. Uh, I think uh, my last night in the showcase. I grew up in this in this building, and I worked here through junior high and high school. And my last night in this building, just before we graduated. Um, we were trying to, uh, Mr. Finley was pretty sure we were going to try and pilfer some stuff out of here. And if we had, we had determined that what we would do is probably, and so it, it, to that end, he parked uh, out alongside the theater on Washington Street. In those days, you could park on Washington Street. So he had his car parked close to the box office so he could see the opening doors. And he just parked there and just was watching the building. So what we decided we would do, should we have done that, was lower the things we wanted out the window of the projection booth. And, um, yeah, I'd have to say probably a, a few things did get lowered. <laughs> it was, uh, I just, that's one of my last views of the Showcase Theater. Uh, this line with pieces of equipment uh, being lowered out the window of the projection booth and, and absconded down the street. <laughs> So he he had to go to trial because of what uh, it, it was uh, he was accused of obscenity for uh, yeah for a... it was right he was accused of obscenity um, after and it was challenged it went up to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling uh, obscenity essentially which um, brought national attention to Petaluma I did um, but but the the judge uh, at the time Alexander McMahon who was my father's cousin yes. essentially here in Petaluma. You had Who was to a prove, chapter in the book anytime? Uh, Alexander Mc, uh, McMahon could could have his own chapter in any book. Oh yeah, he definitely could. He was a great guy. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, he ruled that the prosecution, the, the city essentially, that had been forced to to essentially shut Finley down, that they had failed to present evidence of a community standard regarding obscenity in Petaluma. They couldn't, and that's what the the Supreme Court ruled that it went against community standards, but they couldn't prove that there was a community standard about obscenity. And so uh, they was allowed to reopen the mm -hmm. state theater yeah, and, and the continue judge showing was, deep throat, and the, which and, they showed almost continuously. That was 73. Yeah. It showed uh, that the, the ruling came down. It showed until 1977 there. That is incredible. Yeah, but it was it was a wise ruling. It absolutely shouldn't have gone any other way. No, 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 Finley not, not the ruling. <laughs> oh. The fact that you could go see Deep Throat any night of yeah. the week so, over at the Mystic so Theater. So after the ruling came down, it was decided this one church decided, oh, yeah, is that the way it's going to be? So they parked outside the showcase or the, the state theater and took pictures of the patrons coming and going. They were going to publish these pictures. We know what you're doing there. We know what you're watching. We're going to let everybody know that you're watching this stuff. <laughs> well, I, I can say this is... When I was in high school, um, I had a job working for Finley, uh, changing the marquee outside the State Theater. And when Deep Throat was running, I'd have to, on Tuesdays, he usually changed second feature. I mean, Deep, you know, <laughs> Behind the Green Door ran for a long time, but there would be other features, and I'd always have to change the second feature. I'd have to go into the theater and down one of the little uh, side 
rooms to get the ladder and bring it out at the theater while the movie was going. Finley would only allow me to go in at a certain time every Tuesday night. So I only saw like five minutes, the same five minutes of Deep Throat <laughs> every Tuesday every night Tuesday. Wow. when I was getting the ladder and taking it back in. But I also <laughs> often seen the same audience members in there. <laughs> Well, the internet didn't it exist back, back then. Repeatedly. There was no internet. It was a movie you could see over and over again. <laughs> this was how it was. This is how we did it back then. Yeah, that's what defines yep. a real classic. Yeah. You can just go yep. and see it. <laughs> well, I think that's going to be our third Petaluma episode, folks. Um, John, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure as always. Look, the book is called On a River Winding Home, Stories and Visions of the Petaluma River Watershed. And uh, boy, it's 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 a fun perusal. Uh, you can spend a whole bunch of time with it. Uh, it, it this was, uh, uh, <laughs> John is one of my favorite writers, but <laughs> I, I've always said, sometimes I think he mires himself too much in fact. This particular book, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to say, Tom is the guy who says, never let facts get in the way of a good story. Absolutely. <laughs> in this case, uh, John has got the perfect combination of fact and story going. This thing is a great read. If you can get your hands on a copy of it, it's a great book. Yeah. And Scott's so. pictures, Scott Hess's pictures are, whoa, incredible. Oh, they're great. you, you got to wonder where, uh, where, where his... Uh, where his mind comes from to come up with such beautiful shots of Sonoma County, where, where, where his inspiration is coming from for some of this stuff. So the book is currently so sold out of its first printing, and uh, there will be another printing later this year. But uh, as we all know, uh, the world is in upheaval and everything is slowed down. But John, um, you, the people at some point, if normalcy returns, will be able to buy a copy of this book. Is that correct? Yes, hopefully by next year, I hope. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. All right. Well, we have uh, just uh, completed our discussion of Petaluma during uh, another historic moment, honestly. Yeah, in Petaluma. This, this in pandemic that's going on is, uh, is happening right now. And John, one more time, thank you very much. Thank you. And let's, uh, let's do it again. Say hello to Definitely. Lori, Lori All right, guys, and Henry. Take care. <laughs> Stay right. healthy. You too. Bye-bye.